Over the past 12 months, FSEO has delivered a total return of almost double the S&P 500. And if we go further back to its inception in late 2022, the total return is 70% versus 44% for the S&P 500. That is impressive, but I actually bought this credit fund for the 11% yield. Today, we'll look at how this fund works and why it's outperformed the market. In a recent interview, Stephen Bavaria made the case for credit funds. We were mostly talking about corporate loans and corporate bonds. I'm not as bullish on these as Stephen, but I definitely want some exposure to credit in my portfolio. I briefly mentioned this FSCO fund in the June 9th portfolio breakdown video and increased my allocation in the July 15th edition of Armchair Insider. FSCO's distribution chart looks great. Several increases and no cuts. The only negative is that the history is fairly short. The first monthly distribution was paid at the end of 2022. The yield is north of 11%, but the exact number depends on which formula you use. If you take the current monthly payout of six cents, multiply by 12 and divide by today's $6.17 price, the yield comes to 11.67%, which matches the number on Snowball. Distribution charts like this are pretty handy, but I mostly use Snowball to keep track of my current and future income. I can visually rank my portfolio by current yield, I can see yield on cost, and more importantly, know exactly when the next dollar will land in my account. There's a link in the description for a free trial and a discount. By the way, if you're new to the channel, I retired in 2017, and that's when I got serious about researching my investments in greater depth because now they pay for everything. I mostly focus on stocks and funds paying consistent yields of 8 to 12 percent. The FS Credit Opportunities Corp ticker FSCO is a closed end fund. It generates most of its income by lending money to businesses. The vast majority of those loans are secured first lien, which means the loans are backed by assets like real estate or equipment or inventory. If the borrower defaults, then FSCO is in first position to collect the proceeds if those assets need to be liquidated. A smaller portion are second lien or second in line to get paid. FSEO also holds some non-investment grade corporate bonds. They're not a bank, so they don't hold customer deposits like a bank would. The money they're lending comes from the original capital raised by the fund, along with additional money they borrow or raise by selling preferred shares. Even though FSEO is structured as an investment fund, it's really a lending business combined with a fund. The lending business sources new loans, underwrites, and then manages them. That's a very hands-on business, and it's referred to as private markets or private lending. This is very similar to a business development company or BDC. The other half of FSCO is simply buying loans or corporate bonds as an investor, also known as public markets. FSCO's portfolio has an average duration of one year, which is fairly short. That's generally less risky than longer-term debt because there's not much time between when they underwrite the loan and when it matures. Whereas with a five-year loan, a lot can change between the time when the loan is approved and when the last repayment is actually due. The negative of that short duration is that we can't really see far into the future for FSCO's projected income. This is the fund that you'd want to keep an eye on. You've probably never heard of FS Investments, at least I hadn't. They're a decent-sized investment firm with $78 billion under management, and they've been around since 2007. Their name isn't as familiar as other closed-end fund managers like Cohen & Steers or PIMCO, because their products are mostly targeted at institutional clients and high-net-worth individuals. For example, want to buy this REIT? Well, you can't. At least, not through your brokerage account. It's a private investment, and the minimum purchase is $1 million. FSCO is FS Investments push into the retail investment sector. It's their only publicly traded closed-end fund. And that brings us to an important event in the history of the fund. Even though it's only been around since late 2022 as a publicly traded fund, that wasn't when it was actually born. The fund's history goes back to 2013, but it was private, so there's no public data going back that far. When it was private, it wasn't very liquid. You couldn't just sell it on the open market. You had to abide by their redemption schedule. When FSEO went public in 2022, 
Suddenly, investors had the option to sell their investment whenever they felt like it. Remembering that 2022 was a bear market, paralyzed with fear, no surprise that many investors took that opportunity to cash out. Now, I said whenever they felt like it. That's not quite accurate. They couldn't all cash out on the same day. That would have been disastrous for the value of the fund. The pre-listing investors were allowed to sell in phases, and those phases ended in May of 2023, and that's when FSCO was at its cheapest. After that, any investors who wanted out were out, and the market slowly recognized the discount as a great deal and gradually drove the price up. In hindsight, yes, it would have been nice to buy back then, but there wasn't much data or financial statements to review back then. The newly public financial statements were good, but there was no history to compare anything to. Apart from the yield, here's what I like about FSCO. The fund generated 19 cents per share of net investment income in Q1 of 2024. That's income less expenses. Of that 19 cents, they paid 17 cents per share to investors. That left the fund with 2 cents per share to hold for a rainy day. I'm always looking to avoid NAV erosion. A high yield is useless if the assets used to generate that yield are shrinking in value. If we look at FSCO's NAV since inception, it has actually increased. In Q1, it increased by 22 cents per share. So what happens to this fund when the Fed cuts rates? That was one of my first questions when researching FSCO. I can't predict the exact answer, but I can say that it's somewhat neutral because roughly Half the portfolio is floating and the other half is fixed. The floating rate loans will produce less income if the Fed cuts rates. But if the Fed cuts rates, the value of the fixed rate bonds and loans will actually increase. Before we get into the negatives for this fund, my research for this video included the 2023 annual report, the 2024 Q1 earnings presentation, the transcript of the earnings call, the fund website, that's the easy part, and the six most recent articles on Seeking Alpha. Damon Judd's first of three articles on FSCO was published back in September of 2023, and he was definitely right to recommend it. FSCO has been a great buy, and frankly, I should have read it back then. I can't cover every aspect of the fund in this video, so if you'd like to learn more, I'll link to Damon Judd's most recent article, FSCO Sees the Opportunity, in the description. And if you'd like to take Seeking Alpha for a test drive, there's also a link for a free trial and a discount. Here are the risks and concerns I have about FSCO. The fees are high. They're so high that some investors will get maybe emotionally triggered, but that's okay. This fund isn't for everybody. Let's take a look. The website says total operating expenses of 7.5%. That sounds really high, and it is. And they don't break it down, and... I think they should. There's more detail in the 68 page 2023 annual report. The management fee of 28 million and change equates to 2.1% of the NAV. That's high if you compare it to a regular active fund, but this isn't a regular fund. It's not just a couple of portfolio managers and a few traders sitting around buying and selling some stocks. It's also a lending business with 21 professionals. And as I mentioned before, there's a lot of work in sourcing, underwriting, and managing all these loans. Half this fund operates as a BDC for practical purposes, and for some context, BDC expenses run typically between 1% and 2%. A couple of other big numbers. This $16.6 .6 million in incentive fees. The managers are incentivized to generate investment income. According to a post in the comments section of this article on Seeking Alpha, this fee drops to zero if the net investment income is below 6%. The other big number is interest expense of just under $44 million, and obviously that doesn't go into the fund manager's pocket. Also, if the Fed cuts rates, that number will shrink. These are all big numbers, but the 11% yield is paid after these expenses have been deducted. I know some investors won't invest in funds with high fees, but those investors also won't get these high returns, at least not from this fund. My position on all this is if you can show me a fund in this asset class, which I do want some exposure to, with the same income, the same appreciation and risk, but lower operating expenses, then I'll happily take a look at it. 
A large chunk of that fat 70% total return has come from the price discount shrinking from more than 30% down to less than 20%. The market pretty much mispriced this fund for a while and the party's almost over. Going forward, I don't expect the returns to be that high. The good news is that there's still some discount left. As I record this, the discount is just over 14%. One of the benefits of the discount is a higher yield for the investor. For example, when the fund was generating a yield of 10.12% on its assets, the shareholders were actually receiving a 11.71% yield because they didn't pay full price for those assets. Compare this to, say, ARDC, another credit fund that I bought at a discount, it recently crossed over to a price slightly above its net asset value. FSEO is holding lower grade credit, so if there's a deep recession, it is vulnerable to defaults. Also, the short duration of their portfolio, only one year, means you have to keep an eye on this one. The huge returns pretty much have already been made on this fund, but as long as it continues to pay more than, say, 9 or 10% while maintaining or growing its NAV, then I'm happy to hold it. If you want a brief summary of each investment in my portfolio, here's a playlist covering most of them. My portfolio does change over time though, so for the current list, click the Armchair Insider link in the description. That wraps it up for this look at FSCO. More Armchair Income coming soon. Hey.